Our first reading is from the New Testament, the book of Matthew, chapter 8, verses 18 through 22. Listen to the word of God. Now when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. This is the word of the Lord. Our second scripture reading is also from the New Testament, from Peter's first letter. I shall be reading chapter 4, verses 7 through 19. Again, let us listen to the word of God. Peter writes, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything... God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May God add his blessing to the reading and to the hearing of his holy word. There's an old joke about a preacher who went away to a conference on preaching, continuing education. And when he came back from the conference, naturally his parishioners asked him, what did you learn? Did you learn anything? Was it worthwhile? Are you glad you went away to this conference? And the preacher began to get animated. He said, I heard something at this conference that I just couldn't believe, something I had never heard of before, something I'd never thought of before. They said, most preachers, rule of thumb, most preachers really only have two sermons in them and that they keep preaching these same two sermons over and over again, repackaged, maybe reorganized based on different texts, but basically the same two sermons being preached again and again. And when he finished, he looked at his parishioners and he said, can you believe it? Have you ever heard of such a thing? Finally, one of his parishioners kind of looked up and said, well, (laughs) Honestly, we just can't wait to hear your second sermon. (laughs) I'm glad you laughed. (laughs) Now, I certainly understand the idea of preachers preaching the same message or similar messages over and over again, although I think, I hope, most of us 
have more than two messages in us. But I would say that if I would find myself preaching the same message over and over again, it'd probably be boiled down to these two words, get serious. If I were to find myself, I would guess, preaching the same message or a similar message multiple times, I would think it would probably be a message of exhortation. I exhort you to get serious about your faith. I exhort you to get serious about your relationship with Jesus Christ. I exhort you to get serious about living your life as a Christian. And the reason would be very simple. Notoriously, we who live in what is called the West in the United States and Canada and Europe, we are notorious in the global church for having rather flabby faith. I recently read some statistics that were kind of shocking. One study showed that 80%, 80% of American Christians between the ages of 18 and 29 have premarital sex. And that more than 50% of the abortions in America are had by Christians. Majority are had by Christians. 64% of Christian men and 15% of Christian women are addicted to pornography, and I'd say those statistics are probably low. And the difference in the divorce rate between Christians and non-Christians in America is negligible. You really can't tell any difference at all. Folks, those are scandalous statistics. There's a disconnect somehow in our lives, broadly speaking, as the capital C Church. There's a disconnect between what our faith teaches and the choices that we are making in our lives, how we choose to live. There's a disconnect in the passion, in the commitment, in the holiness, in the substance of our faith. Let me ask you a question. Are you somebody who's been a Christian for years and years and years, someone who's been a member of this church for decades, and yet in your faith, in your character, in your habits, you are pretty much the same person you were 10, 20, 30 years ago. Are you somebody who's been a Christian for years and years and years? You've been a member of this church for decades, but you still will not or cannot pray out loud. It's often taken as a sign of the difference between a toddler in the faith and an adult in the faith. Are you able and willing to pray out loud? Are you somebody who's been a Christian for years and years and years, you've been a member of this church for decades, but you still don't know the Bible. You still don't read it. You still don't know it any better than you did five years ago. Are you somebody who's been a Christian all your life, but you've never shared your faith with anybody? You've never talked about your faith with anybody. You've never told anybody why you are a believer in Jesus Christ. If that describes you in any way, let me exhort you today. Let me encourage you today. Let me try to motivate you today. Get serious about your faith. And the reason is clear. Peter tells us, in our second reading for today. The end of all things is at hand. It's coming. As Paul tells the Romans, salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. We are closer to the end today than we have ever been before. Today is Christ the King Sunday, the last Sunday, as I said, of our liturgical year. Today we're finishing what we began all the way back on the first Sunday of Advent in 2019. Oh, we had no idea what was coming, did we? 
We're finishing telling the story in worship of the earthly life of our Savior Jesus Christ. Next week, we start over again. But today, we remember the rule and the reign of Christ, that He is King of the universe, that He is King of our lives personally as well. And we're remembering one day He's going to come back. And it could be today. It could be tomorrow. The end of all things is at hand. The boss is coming back. And so we need to get serious about how we are living. We need to get serious about Jesus. We need to get serious about knowing Him and following Him and serving Him and obeying Him. We need to get serious about our faith. And Peter goes on to tell us in this passage about what that looks like. He fleshes out what it means to live according to that truth that the end is coming. And interestingly, all that he has to say is about growing in character qualities and growing in holy habits. He says, the end is at hand, so be self-controlled. Question, how is your self-control? Do you have a tight rein on your tongue? Or are you one of those people that your mouth runs away with you before your brain has even engaged? Do you have a tight control on your various appetites, on what you eat and your other appetites? Do you have a tight control over the websites you go to when you go online? Peter says that your self-control and your sober-mindedness are character qualities which will aid you in your prayer. One of the most important works, one of the most important tasks we Christians have is prayer. So, question, how's your prayer life? Do you speak often with the Lord? Do you have many appointments with God throughout the day and throughout the week? Are you able to recognize the voice of God when He, res- when he responds to you in your prayers? Or do you just kind of mumble a few quick words before each meal and before you go to bed? Folks, I'm preaching to myself as much as to anybody. If you think I'm up here wagging my finger, I'm not. This is for everybody, including me. But how's your prayer life? Peter says, we are to love each other earnestly. How is your love for others? Love is a powerful, powerful thing. He says it covers a multitude of your sins. So how's your love for your neighbor? How's your love for your family? How's your love for your coworkers? How's your love for your enemies? We have to love them too. Maybe later in the week, You're going to see one of your enemies around the Thanksgiving table. Are you ready? Will you love them? Or will you just kind of tolerate them, if that? Do you really love them in action? Do you really love other people sacrificially? Does it cost you something? Or do you just try and be polite every once in a while? Peter says we need to offer hospitality without grumbling, which means we need to let people into our lives to make room for them in our lives, to welcome people. He says we need to use the gifts that we have been given by God as good stewards. Every single one of us has been given at least one, if not more, supernatural gifts that we are called to use for the good of the church, to build each other up, to build up the body of Christ. Peter says, we need to speak as if we are speaking the very words of God. Oh my goodness, that rules out so much of what we normally say, doesn't it? And we need to serve, he says, in the power which the Lord gives to us. How is your service? Is it powerful or is it pitiful? Whose power are you trying to use as you serve God and serve others? Peter even says we need to rejoice in our sufferings. That's countercultural, counterintuitive. That we need to rejoice 
especially when we are suffering for doing good, because when we do, we're following in the footsteps of Jesus, and we will be rewarded by Him. Basically, Peter is exhorting us, calling us to strive each and every day for Christian maturity, to systematically and pervasively apply our Christian faith to all the different aspects of our lives. In other words, if we're going to talk the talk, then we need to walk the walk. We need to get serious. because Jesus got serious about us. Jesus got so serious, He bled. He bled for us. He got so serious, serious enough to the point of a cross and a crown of thorns and a whip 39 times against his back and nails in his hands and his feet. Folks, if he did all that, how could we not get serious in response to him? When somebody bleeds for you, when somebody saves your life, you are tied to that person forever, and you need to respond I was talking about this in Bible study the other day. You see those men and women that come back from military service, and one has saved the life of the other. There is an unbreakable bond between those two brothers in arms that nothing can sever. This is what Jesus has done for us. We need to make sure we've got that bond with Him, that we're serious about our devotion to Him because of what He has done for us. How could we be casual about our faith? How could we just dabble in faith? How could we ever have a half measure of faith considering all that He has done for us? In our first reading, Jesus encounters people who seem to be enthusiastic about following Him, and He tells them, make sure you're serious. Count the cost of following me. He says, foxes have holes, birds have air, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay His head. It's hard, as Mary pointed out in the children's sermon, to follow Jesus sometimes because it demands so much of us. One man wanted to wait to follow Jesus until he buried his father. For most of us, that sounds like a really good thing to do, especially considering the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother. But most commentators interpret this story that the father was still standing right there next to him. And so the guy was looking at Jesus and saying, Jesus, you know, I would love to follow you, but I got dad here can't take care of himself, you know. So, so when, when he's gone and, and when I buried him, oh, sure, I'd love to follow you when it's easier, Lord, when, when, it, when it's more convenient in my life, then yes, sure, I would love to follow you. And Jesus said, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. He says, if you're truly spiritually alive, come and follow me and prove it. If dad were truly spiritually alive, he'd come and follow me too. In other words, get serious. Get your priorities straight. Nothing, nothing, even duty to family, can come before your relationship with Jesus Christ. In fact, your duty to family, the way you treat your family, should be a part of your relationship with Jesus Christ, not the other way around. You should treat your family a certain way because they were given to you by Jesus Christ. But everything, your whole life, must be laid down for Him because He laid down His life for us. He gave His all. We must respond. German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer famously said, when Christ calls a man, when Christ calls somebody to follow him, he bids him come and die. 
Bonhoeffer famously did that. He was executed by the Nazis in a concentration camp in 1945, but he wasn't just talking about martyrdom, the supreme way of getting serious about Jesus Christ. He was also talking about our everyday lives, that every day we must die to ourselves, that every day we must lay down our wants and our wishes and our priorities, dying to the idea that we could ever be in charge of our own lives, because as Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And that's what so many don't want to do. So many of us really, when it comes down to it, are followers of American culture more than we are followers of Jesus Christ. Hence those statistics that I quoted earlier, hence why preachers can sometimes get a little frustrated and keep preaching the same sermons over and over again until somebody gets it and listens because we care. We care so much. And it can hurt, frankly, when somebody says, well, you know, I was going to come to church, but it was drizzling out. It was just so warm at home. I decided to stay home. It hurts when somebody writes a letter that says, I can't afford to give to the church, but then you watch and you listen really carefully and you find there's all kinds of disposable income for things that are fun and entertaining, but not so much for the sacrifices. It hurts when somebody says, I skipped Bible study because I wanted to watch my favorite television program. It hurts when people don't pray, when people don't read Scripture, and don't even seem all that interested in those things, because when you talk to them more, they basically say, I really shouldn't have to do things that are hard in life. Christianity should be fun and easy. It hurts when somebody looks you in the eye and says, I will never forgive that person. I don't care what Jesus says. It hurts when somebody says, I'm leaving the church. And when you talk to them, it comes down to the fact that basically their feelings got hurt. And so they're going to walk away. And by the way, yes, every one of those are examples from real life. I've heard every single one of those and I'm not exaggerating. But at the same time, it is so encouraging. It is so encouraging when somebody says, I have decided I would like to join the church. I want to make that deeper commitment that comes with membership. And when you see the excitement in their demeanor, and it is so encouraging when somebody comes and tells you, I just finished reading the Bible from cover to cover for the first time, and I loved it, and I got so much out of it, and I'm going to start over again now and go deeper with some of the other resources you suggested. And it's so encouraging and so exciting when you see somebody come to you and say, you know what, it scares me to death, but yes, I'll be an elder. Yes, I will be a deacon. Yes, put me on the list to be a liturgist. Put me on the list to do the children's sermon. Put me on the list. I will preach for you while you're away. I have no idea how I'll get through it. But yes, I will do that. It is so encouraging. It is so exciting when somebody comes to me and says, the Lord has given me a vision. Let's sit down and pray about that together and make sure that you're hearing the same thing I'm hearing from God. And then you watch and you see how following that vision produces such incredible fruit in the lives of so many people. Folks, it hurts when people won't get serious about their faith. It is so encouraging, the joy, the fruit, and the blessing when people do. Let me leave you with this question. Which category are you in today? 
And if you're somebody that is serious about your faith, let me encourage you, let me exhort you to keep at it. I probably don't have to exhort you all that much because you've probably already learned that, as it says in Nehemiah, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Let me encourage you to keep going in that joy and that strength. If you are not serious, if you haven't really, fully, truly given yourself to Jesus Christ. Let me again point you to the times that we're living in. Let me again point you to 2020 and ask, what more does God have to do to get your attention? The end of all things is near. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Don't you want him to find you diligently serving him when he returns? Don't you want, when the boss comes back, to find you doing what he left you to do? Or do you really want to go stand before God and look him in the eye and say, I'm sorry, Lord, but it really felt more important that I got a few more hours sleep than to come and worship you? I'm sorry, Lord, but it really felt more important that I master that game on PlayStation or Xbox than to pray and to study your word. I'm sorry, it felt more important at the time to watch those reruns of The Price is Right and The Andy Griffith Show than to go help my neighbor in need. It was more important, Lord, that I be comfortable, that I feel safe, even though I know safety is an illusion. None of us are ever safe at any particular moment, but it felt more important to feel safe and to feel comfortable than really to deny myself and to take up my cross and to follow you. Folks, I exhort you, I encourage you, not out of guilt, but out of joy, Let's get serious about Jesus Christ. Let's get serious about His gift of salvation. Let's get serious about the Lord because the Lord got serious about us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To Him alone be the glory. Let us pray. God, we thank you for all that you have done for us. We thank you, Lord, that the end is coming and that it may be soon. We thank you for what it promises for us, eternal life with you, eternal joy, eternal fulfillment, a place in the house of the Lord forever. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be serious about that, to live that out in our lives. Show us, Lord, ways where we need to commit to go deeper and give us the courage to do just that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.